here. Seattle Children's wants every child to live the healthiest and most fulfilling life possible. That includes making sure children and teens are protected from COVID-19. COVID-19 vaccines are safe and will help protect your child from illness and hospitalization. This isn't about beating the odds. It's about changing them for all kid kind. Get your child vaccinated today. My name is Elaine Sulkin, and I am the publisher and CEO of Parent Map. And we are really thrilled to have put together a, I'd say, one of the most outstanding consortiums of the best parenting media in the country. So joining us is Chicago Parent, Metro Family in Detroit, New York Family, and New Jersey Family to bring you our 22-23 Parent Ed Lecture Series. And it's a little sad, this is our last one of the season but we have the best. So thank you for joining us today for Anxious Parents, Anxious Kids, Parenting Tips from the World's Worst Mom, author Lenore Skenazi. You're in for a treat. Um, so on behalf of all the parenting media partners that we have, it's our collective business to help build inclusive, safe, educated, and loving communities for all of our families. And we are truly laser focused on how to better serve families and being the parents and publishers who we are, we really never settle for the status quo. We are always, always about learning. So before we kick off with Lenore, please take a moment and just in the chat, let us know what city you're coming from. It just thrills us to no end. You know, we get Melbourne, Texas, other places beyond um, the publishers that we're with. So go in the chat and just let us know where you're from. And then also today's webinar is being recorded. It'll be republished for educational purposes. And um, when this is over, these the recording will be emailed to everyone who registered. So many parents can't show up at this time, but they will get that. And then also we would really love to hear your thoughts. So the Zoom chat feature below allows anyone to put in a question. We will, this is a question answer format the whole for the whole session. So use that. And then there is also closed captioning enabled by clicking the Zoomed CC at the bottom of your screen. So thanks again to our media partners, Chicago Parent, Metro Parent, New York Family and New Jersey Family. And also to our presenting sponsor, Seattle Children's Hospital, and our platinum event sponsor, the Gates Dis Foundation Discovery Center, and to gold sponsor, Yellowwood Academy. Lenore Skenazi is the president of Let Grow, the nonprofit promoting childhood independence and resilience. Ever since her column, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone, that created a complete media firestorm. Lenore has been declaring that our kids are smarter and stronger than our culture gives them credit for. She is the author of Free Range Kids, the book turned parenting movement that garnered her the nickname World's Worst Mom. So please, I'm not seeing Let Grow. Yes, that was mentioned. Sorry, apologies. Anyway, please welcome Lenore. Hello. I'm pressing on mute. I'm pressing here on you. Comes. Here, here comes. Here uh, she start comes. my video. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm pressing okay to everything. Um, that's probably a good motto for life. Hi. Hi, Elaine. Thank Hi. you. Hi. So good, good to see you, Lenore. I'm thrilled to have you here. And I got to say, I am not generally an anxious person, but reading all <laughs> the questions literally oh. caused me a lot of, right? I know. It caused me a yeah. lot of anxiety. And so I really think I'm going to, I'm going to state the first question, but I think it's really important to like set a play, a, a field of data and information that kind of grounds are now almost 300 listeners on some oh, facts. Wow. 
So the first <laughs> now question, I'm nervous. <laughs> yes. So the first question is how do we teach our kids to be aware of dangerous people and situations without scaring them? I want my children to be educated, aware, and prepared for the worst case scenario situation. But at the same time, I, I don't want to instill fear in them. I want them to explore their curiosity and play, but be aware and safe. Ooh, um, that's not what, you know, you should expect a softball at first. <laughs> I wouldn't call that an actual softball. Um, so there's a couple things that come to mind. And do you mind if I look this way? Like I'm looking actually at the picture of you. Does that look weird to- No, move? do. Okay, great. That, that Perfect. That. Um, and then I'm going to look away because I'm always forgetting what I'm trying to say. You'll get to that point too, my friends out there. Um, the the best advice I've gotten about stranger danger and um, what to teach your kids, uh, actually two pieces of advice. Uh, one is the really easiest thing to teach kids is that you can talk to anyone. You cannot go off with anyone because first of all, kids don't know who's a stranger. You know, you say thank you when you're getting your change. If anybody gets changed anymore, thank you when your thing says your card has been approved and off you go. And was that a stranger, that cashier, or is that your friend? Because you were so friendly with her. Um, simply just making it a divide between if you need something, you can ask somebody, you can listen to somebody, be polite, but you cannot go with them is the easiest way to sort of open the world to your kids and still, I'd say, keep them safe. And the other advice I got was actually from the Boy Scouts, um, which is that because the vast majority of crimes against kids are committed by people they know, not by strangers, uh, the best thing that you can do is teach them the three R's. And I will teach them to you right now at the top of this, um, which are to recognize you're teaching your, your kids this. You can start at age three, just like you teach them to stop, drop and roll. Uh, which thank God I've never had to use, you can teach them this. It doesn't scare them because just like stop, drop, and roll, they don't go around thinking like, oh my God, I'm going to burst into flames. Oh my God. It's just it's just a piece of information. So the three R's are recognize no one can touch you where your bathing suit covers, right? Nobody can touch you badly. Um, resist. If somebody is upsetting you or annoying you, you are allowed to kick, run, scream, punch, do anything. Um, and then finally, report. And report turns out to be almost the most important one, which is report it to me or to another trusted adult. If somebody has been bothering you, even if they said that you had to keep it a secret, you don't have to never keep a secret from me unless it's like my birthday present. Um, and even if they said somebody would get hurt or that you're bad and it's all your fault, you can tell me anything and I won't, I won't get mad at you, right? So you're taking away the, the biggest asset that any molester could ever have, which is secrecy. So if your kid recognizes that nobody can do this and they resist, usually, you know, nobody likes to be punched or run away from. And then finally reporting, you've really lowered the chances that your child is going to get hurt by someone they know and somebody they know is going to more likely hurt them than just a stranger, random stranger on the street that they talk to. So I, I don't want to make any assumptions. I think it would be really great to go back to what propelled you to do what you <laughs> did, you know, cause there was, a, there was a lot of media behind that and, you know, new young parents, this is like, what's the worst mother in America. That sounds like, I mean, sounds like somebody, somebody, tried to, <laughs> somebody tried to grab that in one of their questions and say that they were, but I think <laughs> you going back and telling that story and then adding in real data that like, you know, stranger danger and, all, and you know, like what is real versus what we have like morphed to in our minds that I think that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, so I will cast my mind back as I do on a sort of daily basis to uh, 20, 2008 when our younger son was nine years old and he started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he'd never been before in New York City where we live and let him find his own way home. Um, by subway because we're on the subways all the time. Sounds like we're sleeping there, we're not sleeping. Well, I do fall asleep on the subway, but we're on the subways all the time. That's how we get around. That's how 6 million people get around in New York City every day. And so my husband and I discussed this and you never hear, <laughs> he has never been labeled America's or the world's worst dad, but it was a decision that we made together that our son you know, obviously knows the subways because we're always on them and could speak the language, could read a map. Um, we gave him, you know, we gave him a map to take with him and a Metro card, which is how you get on the subway and quarters, because in 2008, there was still, you know, pay phones around, if anybody remembers those. 
and and a twenty dollar bill just in case something really bad happened and he felt like he had to take a cab or I don't know pay somebody off. Um, and so you know, so that was it. So one sunny Sunday, I, I took him to Bloomingdale's and I said, "Today's the day." And I let him. I I brought him there um, deliberately because it's a straight shot down on the subway on one subway line um, and then a bus ride across. Uh, but also it's a very safe neighborhood. It's Bloomingdale's for God's sake, right? And the subway is right underneath there. So um, what was running through my mind at the time was not, I can't wait to write an article and start an international movement. <laughs> what was going through my mind is we just, we just tried to buy a place and gotten turned down and I was bummed. I was like, well, let's just do this thing instead. It's something you've been wanting to do. And if I felt like it was dangerous, I wouldn't have done it. I mean, that's the thing. People think like I'm a risk taker or I court danger and I'm, I'm a not, I'm like the opposite. I'm, I just do every, you know, I car, we slept the car seat. Whenever we took a cab, we took the car seat with us and took an extra 10 minutes and a very angry cab driver. Every time we got the kids in and out of the car, we did mouth guards when they were playing games and helmets when they were riding their bikes. So I, I don't court danger. Um, but I felt like this was actually the opposite of danger. This was a kid feeling like he was ready to do something. And there's something very positive um, in terms of kids' sense of self, um, in terms of their confidence and their, I don't know, sort of family dynamics. When they know that you believe in them, that's the wind beneath your wings. We can all remember somebody who believed in us uh, before we believed in ourselves. Sometimes it's a teacher. I had a teacher like that too or a coach or an aunt or an uncle, but it's wonderful if it's the parents too. And we didn't wanna say, no, you're too, you're too young, too dumb, too, um, you're too vulnerable. So what we did instead is we went over the map with him, you know, and that was it really. It didn't take much more than that because it was really just four subway stops down and then a bus ride across. We're always on this horrible slow bus. So that was like nothing new. And what's amazing to me these days is how many people are afraid to, um, to let their kids do things that are literally safe. Like a lot, I mean, I don't think a, a subway ride was unsafe, but they're afraid to let their kids um, walk to the corner and go around the corner. They're afraid to let their kids walk to school, sometimes at age eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then they're afraid to let their kids wait at the bus stop alone. And what what galls me is not the, the parents who are afraid. Uh, I'm part helicopter on my mom's side. It's not the helicopter parent that is, driving us all crazy. It's not us. It's a culture that has really eviscerated our trust in the world. I mean, you asked for some reality checks in terms of actual safety. Well, as the Washington Post put it a few years ago, and I realize crime has gone up a little since then, but um, the headline in the Washington Post was, there has never been a safer time to be a child in America. And even though so crime was going up in the 70s and 80s. Then along came those milk carton kids who scared us all to death. You remember the uh, missing kids on the milk cartons? It peaked around 93 and it was going down like this, a little bit of up and downs ever since. But then, and then it went up a little in 2001, I mean, 2021 with COVID and, and some rioting and stuff. Um, but it is nowhere near the level it was in 93 or even the 80s as it was getting up to there. So if you were growing up in the 80s or early 90s or almost any time, um, unless you're like, uh, you know, a, a grandmother age, uh, it was more dangerous when you were growing up um, than it is now. And statistics don't move anybody, but I will give you my one amazing statistic, if I may. And maybe people want to answer in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask a question, okay? If you read my book, you know the answer, but maybe you haven't. Um, so the question is, if for some reason you wanted your child, and there must be days like this, uh, to be kidnapped by a stranger, um, how long would you have to keep them outside, unattended, you're far, far away, um, for it to be statistically likely that they would be kidnapped by a stranger? And um, you can guess, I'm seeing an hours, a week, there must be more than two people out there. How, how long do you think it would take? Nobody else? All right. Elaine, do you want to guess or do you know 24 hours, couple hours? So interesting. It really feels like a thousand years is not even close yet. Three days. Okay, so it basically is going from a couple of hours to all day. And then once in a while, somebody says <laughs> a thousand years, an outlier says a thousand years. But a couple of hours is a really interesting response because that's why you can't let kids play outside. If you really think 
that it's statistically likely that the minute your kid is out there for hour number three or hour number four, you're never going to see them again. Of course, you can't let them out of your sight. Um, but the actual number uh, crunched for me uh, by a guy named Warwick Cairns in England, doesn't matter. Uh, the actual number is 750,000 years. 750,000 years, which is, the, the 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 reason it's such an astounding number is it's it's a statistic. It's sort of like how many um, how many lottery cards you would have to buy um, before it would be statistically likely that you would win the lottery. And while while that number doesn't move the needle for most people's fear, it it can be part of a sea change. It can be maybe something that gives you enough um, courage to say maybe it's not crazy if I let my son and my, my daughter go to the park for a few hours together, right? Maybe they even have walkie talkies with them because we are, what, what I hate about our culture is that it has given us so much safety and freedom and you know we're not in the middle of a war, the pandemic is slowing down, we've got shots for diphtheria and tetanus and typhoid. And yet, um, while this is something that people in any other generation would have dreamed of, this kind of safety, there's no famine, right? <laughs> there's a steady food supply. Um, we, we, are, we are hunkering down as if these are the end times. And it's just one of these ironies that the, the safety and the feeling of safety just don't compute. And when you don't feel safe and when you're anxious, which I totally, totally empathize with, it's a horrible feeling. I get it myself. Um, but when you're anxious, you can't, um, you can't, you, you know, the whole anxiety, the anxiety is that you can't see straight. Everything seems like it's going to be too much or too dangerous or too, um, too harmful. Um, but the only thing that changes that is forcing yourself or having somebody else with you to break through that for that three hour play date with your kid in the park without you. And, and that's the only thing that will change you is really experiencing reality instead of all the fear that has been shoved down our throats by a fear obsessed and manufacturing culture that um, gets a lot of, out of us being afraid. It keeps us online, it sells us products, it makes us, um, you know, it's it keeps us watching television. It keeps us voting for people. It, it, we're we're a society that uses fear um, the way other societies use corn. So you 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 answer this really about your own son. You know, when providing independence to a child, how do you determine when to intervene? But you what you realize is the fabric of your role versus recognizing his abilities. And so maybe maybe objectifying that a little bit because there's so many levels of anxious parents and give a little bit more maybe guidance to a parent who is more anxious. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I keep trying to remember the name of the show in uh, the Japanese show. Oh, old enough. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So yeah. they, they, not everyone knows that show, but maybe bring that into it a little bit. All right. I already forgot what I was going to say besides Old Enough. So Old Enough is this very charming show on Japanese TV. It's been running for like 20 or 30 years. It just finally came to Netflix or HBO. Um, and in Japan, it's called My First Errand. And it shows the extremely charming adventures of children ages Three, four, five, six. Yeah, two. Two strikes me as crazy. You know, two was <laughs> the first. The first episode that I saw was yeah. a two-year-old, and I have had a two-year-old grandson at the time, and I was like, my my daughter and son-in-law have to see this. <laughs> right. Well, so the the neat thing about it is that they send the kids on actual real-world errands. Oh, your father for your father, the sushi chef. Oh, I sushi. Can't even say that. Sushi chefs uh, forgot his uh, apron, or can you go and get the food for sushi? Can you go and get the rice for sushi? And they send the kids to the market, to the grocery, to the to the fish stand. One of them had to climb a million stairs and go to a shrine, you know, for sushi. Um, and uh, you see the kids sometimes crying. And what's amazing to me about the show is that they let those kids cry. 
You know, I mean, in America, you think that that would be like cut or, you know, arrest the mom or, you know, or this this television network is going to be taken to court. But the kids cry and it's almost better when they do, because then you see them <laughs> power through and they keep walking and they get to the market. You know, the market would be daunting for anyone. There's fish stall after fish stall. You got to get the octopus. Well, there's a million octopi, but I always go to Mrs. So-and-so. And then you see the little kid go and, and they, they ask her, oh, well, that's very nice. You're getting the octopus. And then she has to take out her money and then she gets the octopus. And somebody just sent me um, yesterday, a, um, his favorite clip from that show was this boy is bringing home three fish, of course, um, <laughs> from the market and they, they fall out of his little bucket. And then the cat, <laughs> like a cat from like, like it's a, a producer's <laughs> dream. The cat actually <laughs> comes and wants to do it. So he has to quickly get these, you know, he's like crying, he's upset, but he has to get the, you know, the fish away from the cat. He puts them back in the bucket. And the, the reason this show is so important is not because you're going to send your three-year-old to get octopus. You're not right. Um, you're probably not going to send your five-year-old to get octopus, but it's just a great reminder that just because our culture doesn't let kids do anything, and once again, it's the culture, it's not us. If you breathe in pollution every day, it gets into your lungs, whether you want to breathe free or not. And this is a culture that you turn on any, any television show, any website, and you'll hear about something horrible from somewhere around the world. Anyways, this is just a, a recalibration to see that okay, most three-year-olds probably aren't getting the octopus, but some they can, right? And when you trust kids to do something, first of all, um, they're determined. They're way more determined than we think. They really want to help us out, especially at young ages. Um, they're brave. Um, they're sometimes daunted, but they're, there's like it's there's nothing more exciting than an errand for your family. One girl was told to go get um, a, a, a cabbage. And the, the, the producers or the mother had left a cabbage in a little shack at, at this farm stand. She doesn't see the one. So she goes and she, she sees a cabbage and she spends about 20 minutes twisting that like it's the wheel of a giant bus. You know, it's really hard because that stalk is like this thick around trying to get that cabbage out of the ground. The sun is going down. <laughs> you can feel the, you know, the cameraman going like, should we tell her that there's a cabbage over there? And finally, I don't remember what they do. But the point is that to underestimate our children and to overestimate danger doesn't do them any favors and doesn't do us any favors because the only thing that's going to make them brave and make us brave is actually letting go and being amazed by who we have. I was talking this morning to, to a lot of people I, I talked to in a day and one of them was a, uh, a psychologist and I'll tell you about his experiment later. But his main point is that you know, one of the one of the features of anxiety can be replaying in your mind, what if he's hit by a, what if she's taken by a, what if a white van? And um, you can sometimes even see that picture in your head. And the easier it is for you to picture something, and in a culture that's done 15,000 taken movies, <laughs> you know, there's always that picture in your head. And the only thing that can help you is replacing it with another picture. Mm. And if that other picture is of your kid getting the octopus, getting the cabbage, walking next door to grandma's house, or doing something, you know, as nice as playing ball in the backyard with her brother, then you have something else to refer to. So anxiety is pernicious because it keeps feeding us the thing that makes us stop going forward and just sort of... Um, ruminate on the, in the fear and all the things that can go wrong. And so only there's a phrase in, in uh, philosophy, I think that's action breaks the cycle. Only action breaks the cycle. Cause even imagining your kid doing something successfully doesn't hold a candle to them actually doing it. And if they do it unsuccessfully, they get chased by a dog, they get scared by a squirrel, they get they get lost and it takes, they cry and like the, the, the fish falls out of the bucket. That's even better. I mean, I'm starting to figure out, is there a way to manufacture activities where things go really wrong? Because that's when we all rise to the occasion. Um, 
unless you have a husband who always fixes the computer. But in other things, <laughs> I do rise to the occasion when something goes wrong. And that's when you start realizing like, hey, I can handle that. I can do other things too. There's a, you know, confidence breeds confidence, but confidence comes from doing something in the real world, not from, you know, a, a blue ribbon for breathing. Okay, now I'm sure everyone is really curious about this study. Oh, oh, great. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay, so let me backtrack for a second. So after I let my son ride the subway and I write the article and I'm on every possible television show, I start the blog, Free Range Kids, saying our kids are smarter, safer, and stronger than our culture gives them credit for. And then about five, and, and, and for 10 years, and you were part of this, Elaine, I go around the country and sometimes the world, um, talking about how we got so afraid for our kids. And we can talk about it another time. It's also the whole subject of the Free Range Kids book. It's, you know, the media is out to scare us. We live in litigious times. We live when experts are always telling us we're doing something wrong. And I hope this isn't considered that. I'm just trying to trying to empathize with, with, a, with everybody out there who's so shaken by the fact that it feels like we could do one thing wrong and we will regret it the rest of our lives. And so we're scared to take a single step. And we also live in a culture that tells us we have absolute control. Do it right, and your kid is going to Harvard on a scholarship. And by the way, they're also a champion basketball player. And did I mention the app they invented? And do it wrong, and they're home forever. And um, they're either drinking, smoking, or you know, sticking a needle in their arm. And by the way, they're out of shape, and they don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend. And that's all your fault, too, because that one time you said, good boy, instead of good job. And they started, you know, they, there's just so many things that you could do wrong. You fed them, you know, they got a second ho-ho. You didn't realize it. it just, there's, there's so much that's driving us crazy. So I talked about this for 10 years. And then um, about five years ago, a guy named Jonathan Haidt, who everyone thinks is Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, uh, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, was talking to a man named Daniel Shuckman, who uh, had been 10 years the chairman of FIRE, which is an organization that fights for free speech on campus, for the left, for the right, for the middle, free speech for everyone. And they were saying that kids on campus seemed more fragile um, than in earlier years. And it wasn't just their imagination. It wasn't just, oh, the good old days were perfect and we were so strong and now everybody's a whim. It was um, college campuses were reporting record numbers of students like waiting for the mental health services because there just wasn't enough. And I'm a, I love mental health services. <laughs> I'm a Jewish mom in New York. Everyone in my family has seen, you know, some kind of counselor at some point in their lives. So there's nothing wrong with asking for help, but there's something wrong with a culture where everybody coming to college needs it for things that seem um, like maybe it's not that hard, like an argument with your roommate or a mouse in the dorm or food that you don't like. So, or B minus. So, um, and there was also a concern that everybody felt unsafe, even from ideas. And, and that was the word that's being used is, I don't feel safe. I, I feel like I'm being harmed. Um, and so uh, John and Dan were saying, it can't be that kids are becoming fragile and sort of hypersensitive the second they step foot on the quad, you know, and go to their dorm room when they turn 18, it must be something that's happening when they're younger, where sort of something isn't being developed, a sort of insouciance or resilience, or at least a, a resignation that life isn't going to be so perfect, who is fighting the culture that is turning childhood into a smoothie? And easy to find me, <laughs> you know? So they said, well, no, let's start a nonprofit together. And, um, and I said two things. One is we have to invite Peter Gray to be one of the co-founders. That's G-R-A-Y. Even more than my book, I recommend the book Free to Learn. It's, it's just this fantastic, illuminating, and fun to read book about how kids learn when they're excited and exploring and playing. And the hardest way to get information into any kid or adult, me, is when they're bored and just sitting there. So it, it sort of makes the case for the real importance of mixed stage free play. So Peter Gray came and joined us. And I said, besides having Peter Gray on board, the other thing is, I cannot have another, I cannot do another lecture where everybody nods along and says, oh, that's so true. And oh, I remember my childhood so much. It was so fun. Oh, we used to climb trees. Oh, we used to hide out. We used to come home when, you know, the, 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 the bell was rang or my parents whistled or some, you know, something. Everybody has these wonderful memories. And then, and, and they want to give that to their kids. And then they went home and nothing changed. So I said, changing minds isn't working. <laughs> 
you know, what changes people is um, action, behavior, because once you do let your kids do that first errand, go get the octopus, whatever, even, you know, go to the park, that's what rewires parents. And so um, to try to make this action start happening in a culture where we all fear like, oh, how if I walk, she walks to the end of the block, what if something bad happens? Um, we came up with something we call the Let Grow Project. And this is being done in a bunch of schools, but I can't give you the names of them. They're like schools across America, but we want more, more, more. And what it is, the project is this, um, and it's free. Uh, the teachers download from Let Grow, the Let Grow Project, which is a homework assignment. And it says, go home and do something new on your own without your parents. And the teacher hands this out to each kid in the class and they go home and they discuss with their parents. There's a list of things. You can climb a tree, you can run an errand, you can start a carnival, you can, you know, there's a million ideas, mow the lawn. Um, and, and it's for kids K through 12 at this point, but really K through eight. You know, high school kids can do bigger things. Um, anyways, um, the reason we, we really um, hang so much on the Let Grow project is because the parents are then pushed to do something. They have to let go. It's a homework assignment. Their kid's gonna flunk <laughs> if they don't do something. And it's not like we say they have to take the subway or they must, you know, um, you know, go three miles away. It's up to you and your child. But because the school is suggesting it, which is a trusted authority, and because everyone else is doing it, it becomes instantly a social norm. And instead of you being the crazy parent, letting your kid do something on their own, everybody's doing it. You know, some kids are riding their bikes, some kids are waiting at the bus stop, some kids are making pancakes for breakfast for everybody. And then the kids are talking to each other and the parents are talking to each other. And then the parents start bragging on Facebook, which is my very favorite, because then other schools and other parents say, how come he's mowing the lawn? You're two years older. Why aren't you mowing the lawn? You know, he's raking the leaves. And, and then it snowballs. And so it seemed, I, I watched it happen over and over again, where parents are always saying, I had no idea my kid was this competent or this ready. You know, parents will walk the kids half the way to the school and then watch them the, whole, rather the, the other half of the way. And then after a few days, they go, why am I doing that? He's obviously fine. He's looking both ways before crossing the street. So um, I've seen it. And I also did a show called World's Worst Mom, which you can find on YouTube, which where I dealt with 13 families where the parents were very anxious um, and wouldn't let their kids do anything. And I gave them little experiments. Like I would sit with them while the mom let the kid you know, go get the milk or, um, you know, visit somebody go on an overnight. And that changed the parents so much. I said, I keep seeing this. I've seen this over and over again, but nobody knows this is a real, like seemingly psychological phenomenon. It's so fast. <laughs> it's so easy and it's free. How can we, how can we prove that this is not just um, a nice thing? Might as well you know, or, or why worry about it? You know, let's get more, uh, you know, let's, let's ignore this in favor of yet another uh, worksheet on um, fractions. So um, Camilo Ortiz, who's a professor of psychology at Long Island University, um, took up the gauntlet and he and a, um, a, a PhD student of his uh, came up with a protocol and uh, they found five families where the children had an actual diagnosis of anxiety, like it was at the level of clinical um, anxiety. And they, um, they treated these kids with the Let Grow Project. They brought them in and rather than talking about like, oh, I hear you're anxious, there were two, two of these five kids wouldn't go upstairs or downstairs in their own home without their parent. And they, those kids were both 10, right? And, and one of the girls also, she hadn't slept in her own bed the entire time. She's just too nervous. And, you know, and then things get entrenched. So instead of saying, oh, I hear you can't go up there and down, says, well, that must be terrible, or you sound a little freaky, <laughs> nothing like that. It was, hi, you know, your parents saying, you know, parents are nervous, a little nervous, you're a little nervous, let's talk about it. what would you like to do? You know, what would be fun to do on your own? So it's not presented as um, a, a, a bitter pill. And it's actually different from exposure therapy, which is part of cognitive behavioral therapy, where if you're afraid of dogs, I'm so afraid of dogs, you come into the room and, and the first thing you have to do is look at a picture of a dog. 
And the next week you have to be across the street from a dog. And then the next time you have to be in the same room with a dog and then you have to pet the dog, but you're always dealing with this actual fear. This is not about the fear of going upstairs, downstairs by yourself or sleeping in your own bed. This is like, what would you like to do on your own that you think you're ready for that for some reason or another you haven't done yet? And so um, uh, one of the boys who was afraid of going upstairs or downstairs by himself, this is a 10 year old, wanted to walk home from school. And, um, you know, the parents, they're supposed to agree to these things. So the parents said, okay. And, um, and the, the first day he was walking home from school on his own, the mom had to take the whole day off of work. So she was very anxious about, you know, about something terrible happening, I guess. And so, so she takes the day off work and sure enough, he walks home and that's that. And actually she heard from somebody along the way, you know, your son's going the wrong way. He did get a little lost, but he got home. And the next day she went to work because it wasn't that big a deal. And then that weekend, bless this kid, he wanted to take the Long Island Railroad and he wanted, because he's a railroad kid, I, maybe there's some connection <laughs> between me and this kid. But anyways, he, um, I don't know his name or anything. He took the train, his parents put him on the train and then he went four stops, which is probably a couple miles between each stop. And then they picked him up at the end. And this kid didn't notice it. And this is the third time I've heard of it. Didn't notice, but of course he started going upstairs and downstairs in his house without his parents. And then like, if you need proof in the pudding, that was at the end of last school year, right around this time. So then in the fall, he's starting sixth grade. And um, that's a new school. And they, their first day of school, they, they let you come and you're gonna find your locker the combination, where your homeroom is, you know, meet your teachers. And this being 2023, I guess it was 2022, um, the, the, the school sends home a little notice. And of course you can bring your parents with you, something that wouldn't have happened in our era, but it's happening now. And, um, and he told his parents, uh-uh, I got this. And he was one of the only kids at school that day without his parents. So this is why I get up in the morning and, and do podcasts and, and talk to people every day, because if, if something works that fast, that easily, that joyfully, it's free. <laughs> There's no drugs. Actually, the, the, so the study of five families, um, obviously a small pilot, but it found that it worked better than um, actual drug therapy. And it worked um, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, but in fewer sessions in five instead of an average of 12. Um, and, and the parents and the kids like it more because instead of having to face their fear, spiders or dogs or you know germs, they're doing something else. And the, the revelation is that like, just as anxiety can, can spread, so can confidence. And confidence in one sphere can give you confidence in some others. And the other girl who was afraid to go upstairs or downstairs and, or sleep in her own bed didn't even notice <laughs> after she finally took the, she took a city bus by herself, wherever she was out in Long Island, um, didn't even notice, but her parents called uh, Camillo, the, the therapist and said, she's been sleeping in her own bed now for three days in a row. We haven't even talked about it because it happens automatically. And, and what's been happening to us parents is we've been deprived of the permission to do that. And because we've been deprived of that permission, all we have are the scary images in our heads and proof that our kids are only okay when we're with them because that's all we see. And so it, it continues itself and it deprives us of the biggest joy of being a parent, which Elaine, I think you and I were talking about this even before um, this officially began. The real, the real joy of being a parent is when you realize your kid can do things on their own, you know, you, you hear from, you know, she slept over at Betsy's house last night and she put her, and the Mrs. Shaw calls to say, oh, and she put her dish in the sink and she was so polite, I'm like my kid who doesn't do anything like that. It's when you see your kid becoming a human in the world and blossoming that that's the reward of being a parent. Right now, all we're given is the terror and yeah. the admonition that if anything goes wrong, it's your fault. So, yeah. you know, okay. I'm, 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 you're, you're bringing up so many, so many different things. Like I'm thinking of one of my oldest favorite parenting books by Wendy Mogul, Blessing of a Skin Knee, which is just so obvious, like let them fall, <laughs> they get up, you know, but 
we're talking about, I, I feel like um, reflecting on the Surgeon General's recent report. We, we're, and, we're talking to the Surgeon General. <laughs> what? Exciting. We're, we're talking to the Surgeon General. I mean, like he takes our calls. Okay, I'm going to follow up with you on that because I want him to be in our lecture series. So, oh, yeah, but, you know, you compound fear, anxiety, the history that you gave, COVID, parental self-importance, like I can protect my child, the nuclear family kind of getting strengthened and dysfunctional all at the same time with COVID, <laughs> like here we yeah, are. What a mess. Yeah. yeah. What a mess. And then you get this Surgeon General report on social media. All of it is so flipping obvious. Who needs a study? Like, <laughs> it's so obvious. But I'm going to land this with I was speaking to a woman the other day who came. I was talking to her. She has a 10 year old daughter. And I was asking her about, we were talking about the Surgeon General's report and we were talking about social media. And she said, you know, they go to a Catholic school. I love this. Kids are in uniforms. I'm all for that. Um, and she said, the only way we are able to function is by locking arms with other parents so that we together create this environment. And whether that's the created environment around our kids won't have phones. Yes. So Janie and Julie's and, you know, our kids won't have phones or we're going to create a safe play space concept that we lock arms. So I'm kind of throwing a lot into the soup pot, but it's yeah. an unbelievable crisis that we're facing yeah. with mental health, I the agree. isolation, the anxiety. And so and the screens, yeah. Parental power, like let grow is such an, I put it into the chat, but talk a little bit more how parents you know, whether like there's a lot of individual questions, like my son won't go to sleep. And if I reassure him, he'll be OK. You know, there's a lot of individual I've questions through that, too. <laughs> but I, so you can hit on that. But I think there right. is necessity for collective action. Right. Right. Amongst parents. It's the anti-isolation concept. And I think let grow can re be re really be helpful for that. Right. So let's you mentioned a couple of things. I want to talk about. Um, uh, phones and free play for a second. Um, you know, we're all worried about phones. I actually happen to love the lady who runs, I love the whole concept of wait until eighth, where um, uh, you can go to her website and it talks about trying to get 10, 10 families in any school to agree that they're going to wait till eighth grade to give their child a smartphone, um, which therefore is like enough of a nucleus that the kids don't feel like they're the only ones without phones and then it can grow. Um, you know, John Haidt, I work with, all, all he's writing about lately is two things. <laughs> One is that kids need autonomy and free play and the other is that they have to get off their screens. So um, Let Grow does believe that you have to change the social norms, which is what you're talking about. You have to get parents locking arms together for almost anything to happen because otherwise you're just, even if you want your kids to go play in the park, you're as free range as can be and they go to the park and there's nobody there, um, they're gonna come home. If everybody, you know, if there's if there's no one to play with, that, you know, going outside is not the exciting thing. Seeing your friends outside is the exciting thing. So because it's hard to imagine a culture where everybody leaves school, goes home, drops off their book bag, you know, puts on their play clothes, this is like Dick and Jane from like 1952, and runs back out to the park, because I don't see that happening. The other Let Grow initiative besides the Let Grow project is the Let Grow Play Club. And this was the idea of um, Peter Gray. And it's very simple. Again, it involves the school staying open after school or even before school. We've heard of some schools doing it for mixed age, no devices, free play. And by free play, I mean, there's an adult there, but she's she's crouching in the corner with an EpiPen. She doesn't, doesn't make up the game. She doesn't solve the arguments. She doesn't suggest, why don't you try this? Or here's Jimmy. He wants, you know, he wants to play too. So it's as close as it can come to. I, th I think of it like, you know, there are wildlife preserves where the elephants and the and the giraffes still gamble as if like they're, you know, as if it's 2000 BC. That's what this is. This is a child life preserve where the children are playing together in a group, different ages, there's chalk, there's balls, there's an old typewriter, an old suitcase, whatever you want, old junk, 
and they are having fun making things happen, um, but it's in a way that's acceptable <laughs> to parents. And also there's, there's enough of a critical mass of kids so that it's fun. And also it's so equitable because whether you're in the safest suburb on earth or in a dangerous neighborhood, it's the school. <laughs> you were there already for six hours. This is the seventh and eighth hour. And um, I was just reading another white paper report on how important um, they call them as soft skills or future skills are. And what do you get out of play? You know, when you and your friends are trying to figure out something fun to do, you have to figure out something fun to do. That's, you know, making something happen. You have to figure out the steps to make it happen. That's executive function. You have to compromise because I don't want to be first or I don't want to be last. And, and you have to see that you're getting bored and I better change the rules. Let's vote on the rules. That's democracy. And so one of the other theories that we're, um, that we believe, and one of the other reasons Let Grow was founded is that if people can't learn to get along, um, democracy is doomed. And the way you learn to get along is by having a goal that is so enticing that you do everything difficult to get there. And the goal in playing is fun. And if that means I have to go to the back of the line or I can't be a jerk because nobody will play with me or we have to compromise, I thought the ball was out, you said it was in, okay, you know, this time I'll give it up. These are all the social emotional skills you're going to need to get along with a spouse, a teacher, a boss, and, and to, to make this country work. And so keeping the school open for a let grow play club, which only requires an adult on premises for legal reasons, is another really easy way to bring back the free play um, that mother nature intended kids to have. I mean, she, 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 you know, other animals come out of the womb and they're ready to do whatever they have to do. And we're not, we need to have a lot of time to absorb information because, because that's our, our super skill is being curious enough. And then to practice and to practice getting along and passing along information and getting and doing things Require, Mother Nature put the play drive in just like she put the reproductive drive in, which is also very strong and also gets us where we need to go. So free play and independence seem to be crucial. And if you're worried about phones, after school, having a time when kids can be together and they're not on phones at all, no phones allowed, is going to allow them to develop these social, emotional, whatever you want to call them, skills that you can't get with a screen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause for one second as we have mm -hmm. a poll that we're going to put up for people just to really find out where they are logging in from, from what oh. publication. And then, um, you know, there's a bunch of questions, Lenore, about if you have children who are neurodiverse. Yes. And if you can kind of address, you know, the uniqueness that, the, you know, the added anxiety and fears around that. I can, I can sort of address it. I, I wouldn't say I'm any kind of expert on that. Um, I will tell you one heartening story. Actually, yeah, I'll just tell you one. Um, which is that there was a school that the seventh graders were all doing the Let Grow project. And I went to visit it to see. It was amazing how many things the neurotypical kids weren't doing yet. A bunch of them had never used a knife, you know, weren't allowed to ride off their block. Um, one of them was afraid to go to the movie theater with friends because there'd be nobody watching over him. So, so I'd say everybody was eggshell y. Um, but what the teacher told me is that the people who appreciated the the Lecro project most were the one on one aides <laughs> with mm. the kids um, who needed them. And it's because it showed them <laughs> and uh, the parents and the kids themselves that maybe they were a little more capable than they realized. Mm -hmm. So, and and um, I did talk to one of the aides who was talking about a kid who had, I always forget what it's called, but it's a, a obstructive disorder, something where like you're, you're a tough kid. And he started setting the table. And so, you know, obviously that's a win. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can't, you know, if you're, a lot of people will say my kid um, can't walk to school because he's so spacey something that isn't a real diagnosis. And I, I've realized that that's sort of because of us. 
It's like my kids are spacey when they're crossing the street too. They're in their 20s because they know I will stop traffic for them. They can look at their phones. They can space out. They can be complete idiots because I'm with them and I won't let anything bad happen. And I sort of think that, um, you know, sometimes kids will step up a little more when they are in charge of themselves. We've certainly found that in playing that kids figure out a lot more of their, you know, they're a lot more capable at making that happen and solving the problems when we're not there to solve them. But if your kid has, you know, other disabilities, you know, you and your child together will figure out something that makes sense. There's always more that they can do, but it might not be the same thing that their friend is doing. Yeah. Um, there are a bunch of questions about parents' own stress and anxiety around letting their kids be watched by strangers, kind of going and sleeping over at someone's house. I mean, uh, somebody on the chat, they have to be from my hometown of Chicago where there have Wait, been- Wait, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> over, you were, I'm over, from Lamette. <laughs> okay, Skokie. Over 800 shootings this year. So, I mean, we're talking about uh-huh. a very diverse population and, you know, and but that's Skokie, <laughs> but yeah, not, but it is really about parents having the confidence or the asking the right questions. I mean, I am, I am, uh, you know, parent map has done a lot with gun safety issues and a just ask campaign, you know, so you're letting your kids go play at Susie's house. She's a new friend. You don't really know who her parents are. Um, so uh, anyway, address a bunch of questions around parents letting go mm-hmm. to their kids to go to places, you know, how do they gain the confidence that this is, this is right. okay. Well, I think, um, you know, preparing your kids is going to make you feel more confident. And those things that we talked about at the beginning, that they can talk to strangers, they can't go off with strangers right. and teach them that they could recognize, resist and report. I mean, that seems to be the, the fear with with um, overnights or sleepovers is that they might get molested or whatever. They can always leave. They can always, you know, say, don't do that. Uh, you know, giving your kids, I mean, part of confidence that we're trying to give kids through this independence is the confidence to also stand up for themselves, even if it feels a little awkward or they don't want to be the the oddball. Um, the the other thing that I think is driving parents crazy and 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 more and more as we get more technology is the idea that we are in total control. And not that we shouldn't try to ameliorate circumstances, you know, if if there's a dangerous you know neighborhood, avoid it if you can or uh, you know, I'm not saying be heedless of actual dangers that doesn't make any sense um but this this gets a little philosophical i guess or or religious almost but um when my mom i walked to school at age five in this nice suburb right next to apparently elaine's nice suburb uh of chicago and when i got to the corner and i turned the corner after that my mom could not see me which meant that until 3.30, when I came home, she had to trust me. She had to trust my neighborhood. She had to trust the school. She had to trust the other kids, the other parents. And I think that trust is a muscle and we, it's growing flaccid in our culture because we don't need it. The minute a kid turns the corner now, you can watch where they are on find my iPhone or life 360 and the school pings you when the kid gets there and, oh, he got a B minus in his Spanish test. Well, that's not good. And now he's, you know, did he eat his lunch? I mean, you, there, you know, not to mention texting back and forth with kids at school. And the, the reason I think this is, is so corrosive is because it starts feeling like we should be watching literally every single thing they do, see, eat, breathe, watch, hear, that overnight, that that Spanish quiz, the walk home from school, the walk home from the bus stop from the school. Um, It it feels not only, first of all, it rewrites the whole day as a horrible danger that if you're not paying attention, they will be hurt and it'll be all your fault. And then it it makes you feel like um, if something bad happens, there will be no grace because everyone else will say, well, why why didn't you put on Life360? Why weren't you watching? Why didn't you know? Why didn't you install that app that checks all their texts and all their emails? So 
um, the, the thing that gets a little philosophical is until, until the iPhone, until 10 years ago, even when you read Harry Potter and, and in Harry Potter, they had the Marauders map where you could see where, you know, is Ron in the candy shop now? You know, where is Professor Snape? Um, that was fantasy. That was, a, you know, a magical power that nobody had except in fiction or in the Bible <laughs> until 10 years ago. And I feel like, of course, we're thrown for a loop, just like kids are thrown for a loop with all their electronics and social media. We're thrown for a loop because suddenly we have omniscience, like, only God or fate or the powers had before, and now we have it. And it is it is making us worry that everything that could go wrong will go wrong, and why didn't we stop it? And, and that stops us from letting our kids do anything. You know, one person put in a comment different times, and this is, this is what I want to kind of say in support of the viewers and the work that you're doing, which we so appreciate. And it's mm -hmm. like, Yes, we are in an evolutionary different time. But if you don't like what you're experiencing and you don't like what you're seeing, then rally your friends and your kids' friends and become collective and empower yourselves. Because I can't imagine that anybody on this call likes when they walk in a restaurant and they see a family of four looking at their phones and not being together. Nobody on this talk likes that there's a nature deficit disorder with our kids because they don't play outside. And so, yes, I respectfully say these are different times, but if you're not appreciating, you know, what you can, how much power you have as a parent to work against the things that you're not liking and empowering your kids, just like you're saying, um, you know, that's what I feel like the tool we can leave families with today, which is there's so much you can do. And we linked to let grow. Um, <laughs> you're an incredible resource. Um, you know, I, I, I could, I could, we have a couple more minutes. I can leave with this one question. Um, uh -oh. any suggestion <laughs> the one I can't for, answer. Let's hear. <laughs> um, any suggestion for balancing? No, no, no. Sorry. This was a parent asking about learned helplessness. I'm conflicted about the normal child manipulation, anxiety, anxiety, embracing consistency to promote independence, power, and purpose. Wait, what was the beginning of it again? Uh, learned helplessness? Yes. You know, I, I, you know, we all learn helplessness we can because it's so much easier. Like I said, I never fixed my computer and I'm so glad nothing bad happened because my husband isn't here and we would be watching a blank screen. Right. Um, but uh, that's, you know, learned helplessness is easy, but the feeling of confidence and competence and, oh my God, look at me, is also extremely powerful. And you can swap them out. Maybe not for every bit of learned and competent, you know, learned helplessness, you know, maybe get me a bagel, whatever. But, you know, yes, you can go to the, the you know, the store. Yes, you can walk yourself to school. You can make your lunch. And after a while, it's not just, not just, um, a triumph, it's normal life, you know? And kids who are doing a lot of things and making things happen, we all know those are the cool kids, right? And so you can you can take away a little bit of that learned helplessness by assuming that they can also learn not to be helpless and by encouraging that. And that's, you know, uh, broken record. The, the LECRO project is a way that just, you can do it every week. Some schools do it 20 times in a year. So after they've, you know, made the scrambled eggs and made their bed and walked to school, maybe it's time to, you know, make a whole dinner, right? Or take your brother to soccer for once and then start feeling a little more grown up. One girl started doing that for her like row project. She took her, their twin sisters to soccer. And she said it, it improved her relationship with her mom for a couple of reasons. One is she realized it's boring. Like, so she was grateful to her mom. Two, it was freezing, grateful again to her mom. And three, it just made her a little bit more like her mom. She was not just a baby. And that's a nice part of the relationship. Not, it's not sad to see helplessness um, dissolve into confidence. It's fun for both of you. Phenomenal. It's a really, thank you so much, Lenore. You are always a wealth of great information and context and different content that you, you know, put out there. I also want to really, I, I, 
I'm so in awe of the number of people that show up. And this is our final lecture of the series. Oh my God, 280. Wow. We've already we've already booked um all of our speakers for 2324. It's outstanding. And we'll see everyone back then. But in the meantime, let's let's amp up our free range parenting this summer. Be great. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you, Elaine. Thanks for, and thank you, uh, 272 people now for coming. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Try to get let grow into your schools. That's all yes. I ask. Yes. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye.